Uh, I'm not going to talk about the same things that I talked about in September, the same topic, but basically I'm going to be talking about things that I've thought about since then, because this is a field that is changing, it is so dynamic, new research occurs that is really significant for shaping new concepts every month, and I follow it on a weekly basis. What I think is really important about the microbiome in terms of medicine is that if you start thinking about the community within your body, then you have to adopt an ecological perspective, which is one of the things that is really missing in conventional medicine. Dis uh, symbiosis is a basic biological fact of life. Symbiosis is a word the Greek word me meaning living together or living with. And we live with our families, we live with our communities, and we live with the tens of trillions of microbes in our body. But I'd like to start with an image, uh, which is, uh, and a thought. Wherever you live in the world, you inhabit a subtropical climate, which is created by the interplay of ambient temperatures the clothes that you wear, and the heat and moisture generated by your own bodies. About 30 years ago, a team of scientists set out to determine if humans, how humans adapt to cold. So they went north of the Arctic Circle and they studied a, um, a native Inuit population that was living an ancestral lifestyle. And their conclusions were that humans don't adapt to cold biologically. We adapt technologically by generating heat and by using insulation. And they found that for the Inuit, under the reindeer skins that they wore, and inside their very well insulated igloos, they had all the same kinds of uh, skin conditions that they found in similar tribes in the Amazon. So basically, your body is like a movable rainforest. And you keep it that way because that's what humans need to do. Your body is teeming with life, and the organisms that live in your body are as complicated and organized structurally in ways that are as complex as the Amazon basin, and just as threatened by the conditions of the world today. When trying to apply this understanding in clinical practice, there are a few questions that you need to be able to answer. And those questions are, who's there? That is, that's taxonomy. What taxa are present? What do they do, which is function? How does taxonomy influence function? And what can individuals do to optimize both? Now, in terms of the question of who's there, there are somewhere between 30 and 100 trillion bacteria. The 100 trillion factor is thrown out a lot, but it may be less. And there are at least as many bacteria as there are human cells in your body, maybe 10 times as many. Depends on what statistics you look at. There are also, um, there are about 1,000 th species of these bacteria in any one individual, several dozen types of fungi, and the fungal microbiome, called the mycobiome, is now so starting to get the attention it deserves. I mean, when I started out in this area, back in the 1970s, it was because I was interested in the mycobiome, uh, because I was seeing the effects of antibiotics um, influencing the growth of yeast in the body, and it, so it's very, um, it's very reinforcing to me to see the microbiome research uh, starting to rise to the top of the microbiome research. Uh, there are also untold numbers of viruses that are normally present and variable numbers of protozoa and helminths that are largely missing in um, people living in the, in the industrialized world compared to people who were living before the advent of the 20th century. Now, 
what they do it can basically be divided into three kinds of functions. In December, I published a paper in the Journal of Functional Food called The Gut Microbiome and the Brain, which looked at that question, what they do, in a great deal of detail, really went into the medical literature. It's very well documented. Anyone who's interested in that paper should contact me. Um, I can send it to you, or you can find it in the Journal of Functional Foods. They're basically three things. One is an, is an in, impact on your immune system. And the microbes in your gut affect your immune system just because they're present. And to some extent, it doesn't necessarily matter which microbes there are. Just having microbes produces a tonic state of stimulation of your innate immune system. That is really important uh, for the health of your body on numerous levels, not only immune health, but neurologic health, because your brain and your hormones respond to this state of tonic immune excitation. In fact, that's one of the things that is responsible for the normal architecture of sleep. The next thing that they do is they stimulate nervous system, the nervous system, especially in your gut in a variety of different ways and there are sensory afferent neurons in the GI tract that respond to stimulation from gut microbes and they influence the function of the brain. And the third thing is that the microbes in your gut are a huge chemical factory. They produce thousands of substances. The vast majority of substances circulating in your blood are produced by the microbes in your gut. Uh, Germ-free animals have about one percent of the um, so of the na of the the variety of substances circulating in their blood as conventional animals. Those chemicals impact on your nervous system, on your immune system, on your endocrine system, in, on on your liver in multiple ways. Now, so what's the relationship between who's there and what they do? Well, there's a certain level on which it doesn't matter who's there. There's this fascinating study that I saw, I, I think I, I saw it a few months ago, in which infants were followed from birth to about two years of age, and they, their poop was tested every month. Uh, and there was a constant change in evolution in the gut flora because it, at about two years of age it starts to become stable and you maintain a very similar flora for decades. Uh, but the first two years of life it's very changeable. And yet the function of the flora was always the same. It was kind of like an assembly line. The night shift comes in it's doing exactly what the day shift was doing. It's just doing it with different people. And so there's that aspect of the, of the microbiome that there are certain core functions and it really is not dependent on the individual species or taxa that are there. They're going to organize themselves to provide these functions for you and in fact you, your, the fact that you eat, independently of what you eat, helps them to do that. Now, so that's one extreme. Uh, at the other extreme, there is something that I call the Alexander effect. And that refers to Alexander of Macedon. About 2,400 years ago, the Macedonian army conquered a large swath of the world from Italy to Afghanistan. And most historians agree that that would not have happened if that army was not led by Alexander. On the other hand, it's really pretty clear that Alexander could not have done this by himself. He needed the army, and he probably could not have done it with any army. He needed an army that had been trained and developed by his father, Philip. So we have this synergy between an individual that is really able to galvanize and organize an army 
uh, and the army itself and the history of that army. So examples of the Alexander effect, which I think are very important for therapeutics, that have emerged in the past year have um, mostly involved weight control and the effect of genes on the microbiome uh, and on body weight. So we know that, um, that most of your, that, that a lot of the influence on body weight is genetic. And we know this from uh, studies of identical twins that are reared apart. And the, the Scandinavian twin registries, Swedish and Danish, are very helpful in this regard because they track all the skins, all, all the twins in their countries uh, fraternal, identical, those that are reared together in the same home and those that are reared apart. And there have been a lot of really interesting studies that have been done using those individuals. There also is a growing appreciation for the role of a human's genes or an animal's genes in shaping the microbiome. Basically, in creating uh, an environment in which certain microbes feel comfortable and certain others don't. And uh, so studies that were done with the uh, Swedish twin registry looking at the microbial composition um, of stool concluded that about 30% of the composition of the gut microbiome was genetically linked. And 70% seemed to be environmental and related to diet. Now, what was interesting was that the 30% of linkage mostly had to do with an organism that nobody had heard of three years before this study was done, called Christensenella. And that the linkage seemed to involve leanness. That is, those individuals who had a high level of Christensenella also tended to have lean body weight. So then they isolated the Christian Sinella and they fed it to obese, they fed it to mice. And they found that the presence of Christian Sinella in these mice protected them from becoming obese. Now there's been a lot of interest in the link between gut microbes and obesity for the past decade. And in fact, I would say that a lot of the research and the funding for that research has been driven by the discovery of that link and the desire of companies to make billions and billions of dollars by finding the cure for obesity through gut microbes. Um, and it's been a very frustrating um, enterprise because the results have been very inconsistent. You'll see one pattern um, and then you'll see another pattern and another um, uh, in, in another study. And a lot of the early studies suggested that the ratio of two different predominant phyla, Bacteroides, Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes in the, in the stool was the determining factor. Um, that hasn't really held up, but it's still, you st you'll still see that um, from time to time. So there was a fascinating twin study that was done in California that got a lot of press, published about a year or two ago. They took identical twins um, who were disgordant for body weight. That is, so there was a lean twin and there was a heavy twin. It takes a lot of research to find people like that. And they took um, their gut microbes and they fed them to germ-free mice. And they found that the mice that had been fed microbes by the lean twin became resistant to getting fat. Whereas the mice that were fed microbes from the obese twin very easily became fat. And so it was pretty clear that there was something in the microbiome that was responsible for body weight. They then tried to identify which organisms were responsible. They tried using a probiotic that consisted of 35 strains. It had no effect. I mean, it was only the total microbiome that did it. So when you looked at that study, 
would seem as if it's the whole community that's necessary. There's no single organism that can do it. But those people didn't know about Christian Sinella. They didn't know how to find Christian Sinella. And so then you, you, know, you look at, at the, the more recent study, which says, hey, maybe it isn't the whole, the whole microbiome. Maybe it's this Alexander organism, Christian Sinella, that is capable of organizing the whole microbiome so that you get weight loss. And if you isolate 35 different organisms, but you leave Alexander out, they're not going to do anything. You can only conquer the world with that organism being part of the picture. That becomes very important therapeutically because we can then begin to think about ways of altering gut microbes to encourage the growth of Alexander organisms. One such Alexander organism is Lactobacillus johnsoni. Now, and there was another fascinating study that I came across recently, which was done in mice, but I think it's still of interest for humans. Uh, basically, this was done at UCSF, and it was an attempt to look at the effect of pet ownership on the, on the ability to um, generate allergies. And of course, you know, we know that um, people who grow up with pets are less likely to become allergic than people who don't. Same is true for farm animals. Now, they took house dust from a home in which there was a dog, and they took house dust from a home in which there were no pets. And they took groups of identical groups of mice, and they fed house dust from these two homes to them. And the home in which uh, the, the dog dust, basically, that was fed to the mice produced a particular type of gut flora, and the dust from the pet-free home produced a different type of gut flora. And what they found was that the mice that had been fed the dog dust were resistant to being sensitized to allergens, whereas the mice that had been fed the dog-free dust were susceptible to being sensitized. So then they tried to figure out, well, is there an organism here that's responsible? And the main difference between these two groups was a, a relatively high level of Lactobacillus johnsoni in the group of mice that had been fed the dog dust. They then isolated the johnsoni and fed it to ordinary mice, and they were able to protect them from developing allergies. So I would say that Lactobacillus johnsoni is an Alexander organism. It's one that's able to impact on community structure in a way that really makes a difference. Now, so what are the implications of that for us as clinicians? Well, my experience with the use of probiotics is that you never exactly know what's going to happen. That is, it doesn't matter what a controlled study says, and I see a lot of people nodding, so I'm sure you've had the same experience. Introducing an organism, a probiotic organism, into a human being may or may not be able to produce the effect that you're looking for. It may or may not be able to galvanize the community of microbes. And that is probably going to have to do with the nature of the organism, but also the nature of the individual. And, and so this really speaks to the need to individualize treatment decisions, to listen to feedback from patients. I mean, the way that I use probiotics and prebiotics is I try not to change anything else. I make a recommendation. Each patient becomes an N of one clinical trial. What changes? What is the effect of doing this over the next month? And that's, I use that approach for people who have inflammatory bowel disease, people with irritable bowel syndrome, people who don't have gut problems, but in whom I believe a change in the gut flora is needed. Uh, the other thing that I think is important about understanding the Alexander effect is that we're recipients of the Hellenistic tradition that came out of Alexander's conquests. If you were a Persian 
living 2,000 years ago, Alexander would not look like a hero to you. He would look like a devil. And so there are bad Alexanders. And in fact, I would say in clinical practice, it's the bad Alexanders that are the ones you really need to deal with first. And I think that explains why antibiotics tend to be a more powerful tool than probiotics, especially when you direct them, when you're not just using them blindly or in a blanket fashion, but you have a particular goal in mind with them. And often the antibiotics need to precede the use of probiotics. You've got to get the bad guys out of there and then make it possible for the good guys to establish their niche. I hope that that analogy is useful in thinking about how you work with patients. So I think at this point, James, I should open it up to Absolutely. Questions. We have an opportunity to ask Dr. Gallen some, some questions here for the clinic. I'll come around to you, Dana, shortly, but we've just had a couple from Twitter that I wanted to start with. Dr. Gallen, he says, uh, does eating local directly relate to the microbiome? Are we escalating health issues by eating foods from longer distance? Well, that's a very good question, actually. I don't think that's been looked at, but one of the things that really shapes your microbiome is who you live with. And the closer you are and the more intimate you are with other people, the more likely you are to have a similar microbiome. The, um, so without a doubt, there are going to be changes that occur if you're not eating locally. I mean, every vineyard has its own microbiome. I, I just saw that today. Um, but, but I think that's uh, which is maybe why every wine is so unique, depending on the vineyard it comes from. Um, so that's a question that we need to explore. And of course, one of, the big que one of the big issues that's been raised is, what are the characteristics that you want in a microbiome? There's been a lot of focus on uh, biodiversity. And that may kind of makes sense. A healthy rainforest has a lot of biodiversity. Healthy microbiome should have a lot of biodiversity. But the question there is, is the biodiversity what creates the health, or is it health that permits biodiversity? And so I'm just going to go off onto the, the impact of inflammation on the microbiome. And I think this is really underappreciated, even by researchers, uh, when they report on this. Virtually all states of illness are associated with inflammation and they're generally associated with less diversity in the microbiome and they tend to be associated with an overgrowth of a phylum of bacteria called proteobacteria which include the enterobacteria um, like E. coli and Klebsiella and the other pa the, the major human pathogens actually or many of the major human pathogens. Now Inflammation involves the production of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide in tissues, once it's gone through its cycle of doing what it does, winds up as nitrate. And so in inflamed tissues, there is an accumulation of nitrate. And nitrates support the growth of proteobacteria and in general, pathogenic bacteria, which are inflammatory in their effects. Now that makes sense, because if you're a bacteria that thrives on nitrates, then what you want to do is you want to get your host to make more nitrates, because that's going to help you grow, and it's going to squeeze out those bacteria that um, compete with you, that do not like a nitrate-rich environment. So you have this kind of vicious cycle in which a little inflammation causes a change in the microbiome that then leads to the growth of inf inflammation producing bacteria which further um, compromises the nature of the microbiome. So, so, uh, I think that is a model that we need to pay a great deal of attention to because you really have to, you have to stop the cycle of inflammation which means you have to deal with the bad Alexanders if you want to change that situation. Awesome. Let's have a question here. Dr. Dana Cohen, always a pleasure to have your questions. Thank you. 
Um, that last paragraph that you said about the bad bugs was so beautiful, and I hope people really, really realize what he said. It's incredibly powerful, incredibly well said. Thank you. Um, so, do you use a lot of zifaxin in your in your practice? Rif rifamycin. What do you use oh, to treat rifaxamin. bugs? Yeah. Well, I use antibiotics in my practice, and um, I, rifaximin is one of the antibiotics that I use. It's certainly not the only one. I also use antimicrobial herbs, or herbs that I'm hoping will alter the gut flora in a desirable way by inhibiting the growth of undesirable bacteria. And I will say that flavonoids have a significant impact in shaping the gut flora, and I think that's one of the reasons why a flavonoid-rich diet is associated with health. Hi, Dr. Galland. I wanted to get your opinion on using fermented foods, such as sauerkraut, for introducing healthy probiotics into the diet. And then I, my other concern was that would using these fermented food products, like pouring probiotics on the sauerkraut and letting them ferment, would that be feeding candida and therefore causing a negative balance of the, of the microbiome? You know, it's hard to say, and it's going to vary from person to person. A l there are a lot of people who benefit from the use of fermented foods. But then, I mean, I, in my own practice, I have a lot of people who are pretty sensitive to fermented foods. So you have to figure out what, how, how does a, a particular dietary change affect you as an individual? Uh, and I, I, I think our job is, uh, as healers is to help our patients figure that out for themselves and become uh, their own healers. And I'll just, uh, I'll just cite an example that was, to me, one of the most exciting things that has happened um, in my interactions with patient, patients. There's a patient that I've been treating who had a, um, a connective tissue disorder that had really responded well to a dietary change and a whole bunch of supplements. And I'd done this very detailed workup on her. And she got much better and was off disability and back at work. And I didn't see her for a long time. And so I decided to call her and find out what was happening. She basically said, yeah, she's doing great. She has no symptoms at all. The diet is the thing that's keeping her healthy. And basically, she didn't need me. I mean, she had learned how to do this. So she didn't need to come back for a follow-up. She didn't need more testing. That is mission accomplished. Let's have a round of applause for that. I think that's a, a great place. We're just going to have one more question. I see Dr. Hoffman's got a question. Otherwise, we'd be moving on. But that's a good one. I very much appreciate your uh, comments. Uh, how useful do you find uh, some of the uh, stool diagnostic tests as a roadmap to, you know, find a bug, use a drug, or use a, an herbal uh, microbicide? Well, I do stool testing, and fairly frequently. There are limitations, and, the, and in New York State, there's a very limited amount of testing that you can do. But I have patients from all over, and so people come to me with testing that's been done elsewhere and that's much more, much expanded. And... You know, it's, it's a little piece of, of what you have to work with. I mean, I do it, I do it, uh, and I follow it up, but, it, but it's really, it's a sliver of, of the whole picture. Thanks so much for watching, and for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've created a special free video just for you. It's called The Five Steps to Becoming a Leader in Your Wellness Community, and it'll give you some of the starting points on how to position yourself as the leader in your zip code of your health community. All you have to do is click on the link below.